Sam Altman has revealed new GPT-5 information. We're going to play all the clips and give you insight into the future of AI. Plus, Runway Gen 3 is out for everybody, including you. It's powerful, it's pricey, and it comes up with clips kind of like this. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Okay. And it's a massive week for robots from the factories of Amazon to BMW to the killing fields. The front lines whoa, whoa, whoa. of- Wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. I just, the New York Times is talking about robots at war, so we're gonna talk about it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. We'll get into it. It's AI for humans, everybody. So big news this week, Sam Altman did an interview at the Aspen Ideas Festival with Lester Holt from NBC and dropped some pretty big knowledge about GPT-5, Kev. I think this is interesting. We're going to start hearing a lot more about it. The thing we do not know about it yet is a true timeline. And I think you and I have discussed this a little bit, but before we jump into an actual conversation, let's hear what Sam had to say. Preview, if you will, for us, chat GPT-5. Um, what, what will the leaps in technology be and, and does it put you on a straighter path to where you want to be? Um, so we don't know yet. Uh, you know, we're, we're optimistic, but we still have a lot of work to do on it. Uh, but I expect it to be a significant leap forward. Um, a lot of the things that GPT-4 gets wrong, you know, can't do much in the way of reasoning, sometimes just sort of totally goes off the rails and like makes a dumb mistake, uh, like even like a six-year-old would never make. Um, I expect it to be much much better in those ways and to be able to be used for a much wider variety of of more helpful tasks and it does go off the rails sometimes is that a okay this is where sam altman says actually lester i go off the rails sometimes and then <laughs> leaps forward and superman punches him it's the wildest clip ever well okay let's dive into this i really do believe there's a lot going on in this clip and i think it's an important thing to kind of walk through i wouldn't have brought this up if it wasn't the case I think the thing that Sam is 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 saying here through my Sam translating device, which I've now oh please spent, give us uh, the know, Sam speak. Let's go. <laughs> I think what he's trying to do here is prime the pump for what GPT five will be capable of, and I want to just take a quick second to put in context that the thing that almost every anti AI person in the world talks about is hallucinations. Like you will never have a trustworthy AI device because it just makes things up. It gets things wrong, as Sam said. It acts like a six year old. And I think what Sam is trying to do here and is laying the groundwork for a GPT-5 that doesn't do those things. And Kevin, you know this as well as I do, but like all of the people that we respect who are not necessarily for AI in any sort of way, like Neil Patel, somebody comes to mind about The Verge, those are people who often say like hallucinations, they'll make jokes now, like, oh, it just doesn't get anything right. Well, what if it did? And what if it didn't make those mistakes? And I think that's what's happening here. When you talk about a GPT-5, we have to prepare ourselves for a world where we have a GPT-like service, a chat GPT-like service that provides reliable information the vast majority of the time. And that's what I think he's getting at here. Does that make sense? Totally makes sense. I don't feel like he specifically addresses hallucinations in this. To me, it felt more about losing context of a conversation potentially, or being asked to do something and then several responses later, it forgets what it's supposed to do. I think those are things that people are used to having with GPT. The The flare that shoots up into my mind sky is when he goes, it's just gonna put you on the straight path to success. And, and the answer is, oh, we don't know. I mean, we're hopeful yeah. because I feel like I've heard get ready world Everything is going to be rocked when this new model comes out. You are going to be shocked. The leap from GPT-3 to 4 and then from 4 to 5. I feel like I have heard those statements before, Gavin. So it's, it's odd to hear, yeah, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be better. Is that a hedging now? Are they... Well, are they... no. So here again, let me put my Sam hat Please, on. Yeah, because I, you think, speak, I think it's You important. speak Altman. I this, don't. I, I've been trying to think about what this messaging is. And I think we've said this on the show, but I believe that there is a real couching of how valuable and important this technology can be going forward, right? And I think part of what they're dealing with now at OpenAI and a lot of these AI companies is dealing with the public perception of what they say and how they say it. I have a feeling that GPT-5 is not as far away as Sam might make it sound here. But again, who knows? I was a little surprised to hear them say and to hear him say this clip that they're still working on it. Yeah. I don't know what that means. I'm working on it before. could be just red teaming it, making yeah. the interface yeah. prettier potentially. It might have nothing to do with the core model and its yeah. capabilities. Exactly. And I think, you know, there's another clip that, you know, Bill Gates surfaced to Bill Gates this week. Yeah. And I think this goes to the point of 
Bill Gates is another important thinker. We've talked about Kevin Scott, Microsoft CTO, a lot of people trying to prime the pump again to set people up for what is coming next. And Bill Gates talked about scaling. I have yeah. that clip. Shout out to Sarnik, by the way, who clips out the juiciest stuff. It's definitely worth a follow over on X. But here's Bill Gates talking about the next two generations of AI. The big frontier is not so much scaling. We have, you know, probably two more turns of the crank on scaling where by accessing video data and getting very good at synthetic data that we can scale up probably, you know, two more times. I'm going to pause there for the broad audience. That's really juicy, right? Yeah. Okay. Two more cranks of the old wheel. So scaling is throwing more into the machine to train a model on it. And we've talked many times and never AIers complain that everything was swept into these models, all the artwork, all the writing, eventually all the music and audio. And as Bill Gates just said there, all the video. So we know, okay, they're going to be training on the YouTube and TikToks of the world. They're going to use synthetic data. So they're going to use their own text to video generators to make videos. And that goes into the machine now to train it. So two more cranks of the wheel. So potentially two more years, give or take, of these models getting better just from scaling them, just from throwing more at them. That is already exciting to me. Like yeah, if you're, I mean, it may, it's going to mean that you're going to get better stuff within the next two years. Look at two years ago where all of these tools were, where all of these models were. And wow, that's a lot of progress. So we already know just by brute force, the dumbest means possible, slamming more data, this world is going to get more exciting. But then... It's not the most interesting dimension. The most interesting dimension is, is what I call metacognition, where understanding <laughs> new how term. to think about a problem in a broad sense and step back uh, and say, okay, how important is this answer? So I, I think the biggest thing that people out there have to realize about AI is that there's all this kind of magic that's gone into the system, but then we can start adding layers to it, right? So when you look at how there's been all this talk about QSTAR or this way of looking at data, and one of the things is how do you get an AI to be reflective about an answer before it delivers it out to you. Actually, OpenAI just had a story that came out about this. They created something called Critic GPT, which is a model based on GPT-4 that writes critiques of chat GPT responses to help human trainers spot mistakes during RLHF, which is- what, Reinforcement real learning from human Re feedback. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And this so Critic during, GPT yeah. is only in the voice of John Lovitz. It stinks. <laughs> Oh no, exactly. Well, everybody, I'm going to tell you what you did wrong today. Anyway, this is a good example of you're basically adding a layer onto it before it answers the question. And this is what Bill's getting at with metacognition, which is an amazing term, something I'd only heard in sci-fi before. I'm sure lots more people use it all the, de all the time. But this is the idea of the AIs will improve by getting bigger and bigger models, but at some point, what you do is you start sifting through and sorting that data better. Now, Kev, the thing for people out there to know is that like, that is a lot of compute as well, right? Because imagine sure. we're already going to the scenario where you have like, you ask one question and then you come back and it takes a little while. Yeah. Now, if you ask a question, it's got to go through a couple layers totally, of figuring yeah. out if it's right first. Yeah. It's very straight line, even though the best in class do a little bit of magic there, but it's mostly input and you get your output. And here it's going to be yes. input it does 10 different pieces of output, analyzes that output, then looks at the original input and goes, okay, which one's best and why? And then let me double check against this database here to see if, did I make up that number? Is it actually in there? There's a lot more compute that yes. is going to be necessary. And that's okay, because last I checked, there's still some ice caps left. Well, the funny thing you say that is there was actually a story that came out this week from Google that Google <laughs> released a statement that basically said they are not going to meet their climate challenges and yeah. they were on the pathway to doing it. But Kevin, it used to be like they were on the pathway and then this year they're like 50% above yeah, it's, what Yeah, I was going to say it's be. above 50%. It's like 50 actually we... Above we, we we had the wrong emphasis when we made our pledge. We want to challenge the climate. That's <laughs> yes. what we wanted to do. We want to take climate on. We think we can crush and the it. Reason, the reason they give for this is exactly the what we all worry about yeah. is generative AI, right? Yeah. Because they're, they turned a corner right after ChatGPT went out when suddenly they had to use a lot of resources to spend on generating these models. And this is going to be another narrative issue that we are going to deal with going forward as people who enjoy working with and looking at the progress of AI, 
it is going to take a ginormous amount of energy to run these models. And the big question we're going to start asking ourselves is, okay, where do we find that energy? How do we morally deal with the fact that this could conceivably push climate uh, change narratives in a significant way? So these are major problems that Sam himself and Bill and all these people are aware of that we're going to be entering. And Gavin, we know you're a clean coal fan. You often talk on the podcast about yes. the, the liquid gold that's under our feet right now and how we need to drill. That's me, and Gavin McClintock. I'm a coal miner from the old days who's come to the modern day to show you the power of coal. <laughs> Look, there's optimizations that can happen. And I think ultimately, even the Sam Altmans of the world will agree yeah. that oh, we need to solve some energy hurdles, right? We're going to have to leap yes. them on this path to AI. I think rightfully so. Some people would say, uh, wait, why? Excuse me, why? Why are we doing this yeah. again? Some of the AIers will say, well, it's because along that path, AI itself is going to Gotta help solve us solve energy yes. and physics and medicine and put artists out of work and whatever you want to think these AI are going to do. Do you think do you think they're being genuine? What percentage of you believes that they actually think it's going to help them solve energy? And what percentage of you thinks they're like, ah, screw it. I'm going to build this big data center so I can have the smartest machine ever. I, you know, it's a really a hard question. I, I do believe myself personally that eventually this can help us solve energy, but I'm not sure we're that close. It's going to be a bumpy few years. But Kevin, we actually spent some time wasting a ton of energy. And I'm sorry, Mother Earth. That's what I, I mean. Apologize. What a transition. We, like, listen, okay. Yes. <laughs> Did some polar bears have to tread water for a little while for us to make yeah, silly AI I'm videos? I'm sorry, Miami. Yes. I'm sorry, Miami. Yes. So Runway Gen 3 is out for everyone this week. We spent a bunch of time with it. If you're not familiar, Runway Gen 3 is Runway ML's new text-to-video um, engine. It's very good. It has a lot of issues that we'll kind of get into briefly here. But Kevin, what my experience with it so far was I was impressed by some stuff. I was also kind of underwhelmed by some of the exports and it was really that slot machine aspect where you really aren't sure what you're going to get out. I think I've seen some incredible, incredible people's examples of stuff that's out there and, and Runway's shared quite a bit of them. But it makes me wonder, based on my experience, how many generations do they have to do to get these really remarkable results? Because that my, overall, it was like, this is super powerful. I'm still learning how to use it, but it wasn't like everything I got looked amazing. So I want to level set for folks here, not a sponsored segment whatsoever. Runway did invite us, thankfully, to their creators program where we yeah. basically were gifted a bunch of credits. So when we say it's expensive, because it literally can be expensive to generate the stuff, I don't know that there's a world where I would have been able to experiment as much as I did with Gen 3. So I'm very, very thankful for Runway giving us those credits. I would have to caution somebody, though, that is going to put their credit card into the machine. If they have a very specific vision, they're going to be burning a lot of credits and potentially yes. a lot of real world money on the path to achieving their vision. So my my heart bleeds for all creatives that are using tools like this right now and that aren't getting comp credits because it is pricey. But that said, some of the results are jaw dropping and they hint yes. at the future. And it's just, it's so wild to me, the rapid fire hits of Luma and Kling and of even just the Sora videos, which we can't use yet, but even just seeing that, this is an arms race that is heating up faster than I thought. So let's talk about our experiences with it though, good, bad, ugly, and otherwise. To generate a Gen 3 video right now, you get a basic prompt window and that is about it. There's not really fine tuned controls for like painting on a thing or dialing in the camera movement. And they have a prompting guide, which we'll probably go into a little bit, Gavin, to help you with setting yeah. up what your camera angle is, what type of shot it is, how to describe the visuals that go into it. If you stick to the rivers and the lakes that Gen 3 is used to, you can get some really, really powerful stuff. When you start to mix things up and ask for surreal things or something that might not have gone into the model, I feel like it struggles to hallucinate the weirder yes. stuff that you and I are asking it for. So uh, the, a couple cool things right away. It's weirdly good at generating text prompts. So like so we, I'll that. show some of these in the video here, but I made some AI for humans logos in within it. One of them looked like a like almost like a shiny floor game show. Another one was a, an ambulance driving away in a puddle that turned into the logo AI for humans. It can actually do that kind of well, which I was impressed by. Another really cool thing is that Smoke Away on X actually asked it to answer a question. 
Smokeaway said, top-down view of a response to what is the capital of France on a piece of paper, and the video actually writes out Paris, which is kind of cool. I then followed up and specifically asked it for top-down view of spelling the response to when will AI eliminate humanity on a piece of paper, and it said it won't, W-O-I-N-T, it won't, but that's pretty good. It said it won't, so that's a good sign. It struggled to lie through its digital teeth. The thing that really disappointed me, and again, this is not Runway's fault necessarily, because it's really difficult, but like some of the more weird things that I'd like to see, it was really not great at. Let's talk about some of the weirder stuff because you and I wanted to do a video for like a bizarre plastic surgeon. Yeah. And yeah, we, we really tried to get things like even an eyeball in someone's forehead or a leg sticking out of someone's chest. I feel like the hit to miss was probably like one out of every 15 generations. And we'll show a bunch of those on our video here, but like it definitely, we it kind of restricted us, right? And I think one thing that's really important to know is Luma has the ability to do image to video. And image to video means that you can take a still frame, like you can create something and use that as your starting point. And when it's just text to video, you're really having to hope that it's understanding what you want. Um, and I think one thing, Kevin, I just sent you this video. Oh, of, I, I, have I, it I, I had a I had a prompt called low angle static shot. The sky is raining hot dogs. Two large men sit on a bench eating them as they fall in their mouth. And I will tell you one thing that it does not do well with is hot dogs. So you see a video here of two men's faces coming into the frame and a bunch of, I guess, almost like half donutty looking things falling from the sky. This one is guy a 7-Eleven bastardization of a yes. hot dog that was yes, rotating exactly. under a heat lamp for too long. But the fact that it has a, like an ounce of physics in there is really interesting yeah. to me, the way yeah. the hot dogs kind of bounce off faces and cause ripples. I think the downside is it's powerful, but it is that slot machine where you never know what you're gonna get out. So you might find yourself wasting a bunch of credits. Again, first pathway, the beginning stages, I'm sure it'll get better, but it's a really interesting thing to dive in on. I would say for very specific out of the box concepts that you have, yeah, you are going to the slot machine. If you're looking for stock footage, you messed up a shot on something else and you just need to cover it or even that title sequence because it is so good with text and physics effects. Like all day, every day, super impressive. That is great. When they unlock that Luma ability that you talked about where you can start with an image or start in one place and get to an image. Yes. This will be so much more powerful. And the speed with which Luma unlocked that and knowing that Runway already has expertise with tools like that. I I'm not a betting person, but I would put the over under at only a few weeks before we see yes. additional tools coming out along those lines. And that will be a giant unlock. I think that you're then you're going to start to see the videos that will be really impressive at that point. Kev, we have an opportunity here because this is our chance to bring in a special guest. We have a new special guest for today's show. We have a director, a film director that has joined us to talk a little bit about Runway Gen 3 and talk about AI and video in general. Should we meet our AI co-host? Oh, now more than ever. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, let's get this show on the road. I'm Quentin Vertigo, the madman behind Puppet Fiction and Reservoir Clogs, AI and filmmaking, oh, my Clogs. two obsessions, colliding in a wild, beautiful mess. Gavin, Kevin, AI for Humans fans, buckle up. D D okay, okay, now we've got... We're now diving we're into oh, AI cinema. Wait, what happened? It's like giving a monkey a typewriter and expecting Hamlet but with a PhD in film studies. Seriously, why can't AI get the guns right? Have they never seen a John Woo film? Okay, hold Let's on. Let's get crazy. Hold Let's on. get wild and make some cinematic magic. Welcome okay, to the Vertigo Quinn. Zone. Okay. Oh, that's a cool oh. catchphrase. That's, there was a lot there and I thought there was some misdirects. I, he broke my ankles twice. I thought he was done, mm -hmm. but Quentin <laughs> Vertigo had a lot yet. to say. Okay, so is this like a meta commentary on the fact that AI is knocking off human creatives, so we brought on a knockoff Quentin Tarantino AI. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. So we've, we're introducing our AI co-host here. This is a character that we've created with AI. We asked it to generate a uh, AI filmmaker, a filmmaker who could talk about AI, but also sounds like he's against AI as well. And we are using a version of a voice of a famous film director. Let's just put it that way. I got to ask, because Reservoir Clogs and Puppet Fiction were not something that you or I put in this prompt. We did say that no. bad puns are encouraged. So I've got to find out about this filmography. Can we get a little bit more? Oh, I'd love to hear more about what he's made. Quentin Vertigo, tell us more. Kevin, hold on to your hat. My filmography is a roller coaster ride through the bizarre and the brilliant. First, there's puppet okay. fiction, a mm -hmm. twisted take on Tarantino's classic, but with marionettes. Then we have Reservoir Clogs, <laughs> a tale of high stakes heists in a Dutch clog factory. 
Pure oh. genius. Okay, that's right? the one that okay. knows, actually. Don't forget, Quentin. Kill Bill Voller 3, Bridezilla's Revenge, where I oh. took Uma's vengeance to a whole new level of bridal chaos. Then there's Inglorious Bastards, but with a twist. No Nazis, <laughs> just rival pastry chefs in a cutthroat baking oh. competition. Oh, and wow. who could overlook Django Unwired, where I fuse spaghetti westerns with cyberpunk aesthetics? Now this My is... films are a wild, unpredictable ride through the cinematic landscape. No, that's bad. I'm sorry, Quentin. Not to be disrespectful of our AI guests. <laughs> that just sounds that's bad. bad too. That sounds bad. So let's ask Quentin what he thinks about the idea of AIs particularly learning how to write and make films. Uh, AI learning to create films. It's like giving a blender to Picasso and saying, paint me a masterpiece. Okay. The potential is mind blowing but it's a mixed bag, you know? AI could nail the technical stuff, camera angles, editing, even lighting like a robot on a caffeine rush. <laughs> it could probably spit out scripts faster than a machine gun in a spaghetti Western. Okay. But, oh. and this is a big but, it might lack that human touch, that je ne sais quoi, that raw gritty soul that makes cinema magical. Imagine probably AR would. to... So, AI, Quentin, Quentin, are you trying to capture the chaotic genius of plump friction or the intense drama <laughs> of reservoir friction. clogs? And it's like expecting a toaster to write poetry. Plump Possible, friction, but um, weird. And those damn guns, man. AI just can't get the guns right. <laughs> They'd probably be better okay. at rom coms and nature documentaries than gritty, heart pounding thrillers. Okay, so probably AI true. filmmaking, a beautiful mess waiting to happen. That's great. I think Quentin okay. had about a vertigo in the middle of his answer, which is the best part. <laughs> it's so on brand. I want to, before we leave Quentin, Let's I know ask it, about this is plump be friction. Let's I knew it. I knew. Do we have let's to ask, ask about <laughs> plump friction, Gavin? <laughs> yes. Let's ask one quick. Can you tell us, give us just the log line for plump friction, and then we'll walk away from him. Because I do want to know just where the hell that came from. Right, guys. Here's the log line for plump friction. In a world where fast food reigns supreme, two bumbling hitmen find themselves in over their heads as they navigate a greasy underworld of burger joints, milkshake heists, and deep oh. fried deception. Okay. Different than what I thought. Now, for my favorite catchphrases from the movie. One, Royale with cheese, more like Royale with grease. Two, you know what they call a quarter pounder in Paris? A cardiac arrest waiting to happen. No. At three, hamburgers, the cornerstone of any nutritious breakfast. What? Four. That's it? Four. I'm sorry. Did I break your concentration? How about a refill on your fries instead? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba -ba. And Paul Schaefer folks, takes us out of this folks, bit. Sometimes it doesn't work so well, but welcome to the world of AI. There's a lot of work to go, and maybe we shouldn't be uh, melting the polar ice caps to be doing this, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, apologies to anybody shouting why at their Spotify over this one. Because, exactly. yeah, I don't know anymore. But thank you, Quentin Vertigo, for that. And Gavin, cloning celebrities is something that we do from time to time. We have fun, but now we can legally. So this is a really pretty crazy story. So Eleven Labs, the company that we use often to make our voices to do things on this show, whether they are clones or they are actually just original voices that we create ourselves, has officially licensed four voices. And these are kind of weird voices when you think about who they are, to allow you to listen to both articles, texts, or anything you want in real time. And those four voices are... Judy uh, Garland, um, Judy Garland, James Dean, uh, James Dean, Burt Reynolds, <laughs> and Burt Reynolds, Lawrence uh, Olivier, <laughs> Lawrence Olivier. Probably, I would say anybody under thirty doesn't know who these people are. But we wanted to at least hear one of these, is what it said. So I went and had Burt Reynolds read. I went and looked at some of the best copy pasta that I could find, and I went and had Burt Reynolds read one of these for us. So Kevin, if you can play that little clip I sent you, and we'll take a listen to how Burt Reynolds sounds. My grandfather smoked his whole life. I was about 10 years old when my mother said to him, if you ever want to see your grandchildren graduate, you have to stop immediately. Hmm. Tears welled up in his eyes when he realized what exactly was at stake. He gave it up immediately. Wow, this is... Three years down. later, is... he died of lung cancer. Oh, man. It was really sad and destroyed me. My mother said to me, don't ever smoke. Please don't put your family through what your grandfather put us through. I agreed. At 28, I have never touched a cigarette. 
I must say, I feel a very slight sense of regret for never having done it, because your post gave me cancer anyway. Oh, it Gavin. Was in face. Gavin. So anyway, Gavin. that was just a straight up text. So what's what's fun what's fun about this idea is that you can take now any article any text or any sort of written piece and have these celebrities read it. Now, do they mean something to the vast majority of our audience? Probably not, but this does signal a future, Kevin, yeah. where celebrity voices or celebrity personas are going to be able to do things specifically for you. And I don't think that Burr Reynolds been saying this. probably thought, yeah. We've yeah. been saying this, right? There's going to be a Napster moment and then there will be a Spotify in the wake of it. We don't know what those timelines will be, but yep. just as certain celebrities have gone after and have sued companies for taking their likenesses and reproducing them, it's clear that others are working with the tech companies. In this case, Eleven Labs, they worked with CMG Worldwide. They're a Beverly Hills-based IP management firm. This is according to the Variety article. They represent the estates, essentially, of folks like Liza Minnelli, who's the, well, the daughter of Judy Garland. So CMG Worldwide you know works- Liza Minnelli is, right, Kevin? Just to work clear. I mean, oh my God! I know Wait a the second. Name. Let's dive in on this. I know, you know who the Liza name. Minnelli is. Come the, on, what the American actress, singer, dancer, and choreographer? <laughs> All I know, I don't know much about you Liza. You probably know her from uh, Arrested Development. She was on Arrested Development. Yeah, I know. Google see, her. no, it's not. I know her for her commanding stage presence and her powerful oh, alto singing of voice. That's how do. I know, and of that's how other people my do. age <laughs> know her. Oh, people your age, because you're what, 25? Eleven Labs worked with the estates. They got permission. They legally licensed these voices. I'm not shocked to see this happening. I will be shocked if almost everybody isn't offering their essence in this form in the yeah. future. Yeah, and by the way, CAA is actually the, the famous uh, agency has created a company internally to allow their celebrities, their, their clients to do this sort of thing. So I think this is the, the side of the AI business that is going to keep going, right? Like no matter yeah. what, even if somebody says, okay, GPT-5 doesn't work, hallucinations aren't gonna be a thing, this part's here already and, and we're clear and, it's, and now it's just about uh, how to get the legal stuff worked out. It is going to be weird. It's going to be really weird yeah. when Burt Reynolds starts saying things. But more importantly, not Burt Reynolds. It'll be more interesting when like the Master Rock Chief is things. talking about gooning. Yeah. Well, what is gooning? Now I don't oh, know what don't, you're talking about. No, don't. I don't, don't. want to know. I don't. Wanna... But imagine the Hawk Tua girl. She suddenly has her own voice, right. and you can like create. That's a the direct representation now. Like she's out there. She's famous. Like. Yeah. Doc to a girl is 100% going to I create I spit on that thing version. while I'm on a skibbity toilet voting for President <laughs> Biden. Like, whoa, that's a whole welcome, lot of worlds I did welcome, not need colliding. Welcome to the election 2024. <laughs> it's pretty, it's going to get weird, everybody. It's going to get weird. Speaking of weird, Kevin, we need to talk about what is, I think, one of the most interesting. And we, let me do this. My back. new segment called Hawk Takes with the Hawk to no. a girl. We clone her <laughs> and she gives yes. her Hawk Takes on topics. Actually, that would have been a good AI co-host for this week, maybe better than Quentin Vertigo. But next week, we always have next week where she's over at this point. That's right. Okay, really quick. We have a really fast, interesting update from Meta. There's a new text-to-3D pipeline that they have created called Meta 3D Gen. And this is something Kevin and I have been covering this space for really the last year we've been doing the show. The kind of holy grail of asset generation with AI is like, can you put something into text and then immediately create a 3D model that allows you to drop it into places like Blender? or to video game engines and all sorts of interesting Or have it pop things. up in augmented reality in your glasses yes. because you've asked for it in your personal holodeck. That's exactly right. So they have created Meta 3D Gen, which is a new end-to-end -end generation of 3D asset system. And Kevin, it looks really good. Like every one of these we've seen before has been like okay at certain places or doesn't go all the way. This one seems pretty significant to me when you watch yeah. it, what it's doing. Now, I haven't played with it and I don't think you've played with it either, but... I really think this one could be the next big step towards this video game asset generation situation. It looks like the paper is out on it, but not the models, not the weights. So it's basically we're beholden to their demos, which we don't know how cherry picked they are. However, the promise here is that three to 10 X the speed of existing work in the space, which means in about a minute, you can go from a text prompt to a full mesh 3D model with high resolution textures on it. And it's two different yeah. systems, Gavin. It's one that makes the mesh model. Then there's another system which paints the texture on it. And they have some crazy examples of like, make this model look like it belongs in a horror movie. Okay, no, no, now make it look pixel art. Now make it yeah. look like something completely different. So you can imagine the speed with which 
a game creator could populate their world with objects and then apply their art style to all of those objects. Or if you want to have a game that's bright, sunny, cheery, pixel art style, and then you grab the wrong power up and it turns into Resident Evil or Silent Hill, yeah. an artist just has to prompt that in and it swaps all the textures. That's amazing. Kevin, I want to say something I feel bad about for the world of of of, <laughs> of robots in general. What do you want to say? Why Jeff? do we make all robots do these freaking dances now? Like every every person that every model has to do the Fortnite dances now. So this robot looks ridiculous doing this dance. It's impressive technology, but robots, I'm sorry. I want to go on the record. I do not mean you to be embarrassed like this. So I apologize. They're gonna do this it, dance on your grave, Gavin. They're not gonna care. You've done enough. Right. to soil you're the right. sanctity of AI. You're right, you're right. I'm already too far I'm already too far gone. I will point out what is interesting about that model though is that they the text prompt was a futuristic robot and then they used uh, Mixamo, which is another technology to automatically rig that high quality model and apply animation to it. So when we talk yeah. about just like populating a world, whether it's your coffee table in your living room or a 3D game that you and your friends are just making for funsies because it'll be easy enough to, like this is wild that you can prompt something into existence and have it moving about in full 3D. Like, again, we have to get our hands on it for sure, but this looks yeah. really promising. So speaking of robots, it's time for us to do a quick catch up on robots in Robot Watch. A new story that popped out over on Yahoo caught my attention, Gavin. It is Amazon grows to over 750,000 robots. It is the world's second largest private employer, and they replaced about 100,000 humans. When we think about robots in the workforce, we're almost always talking about five years from now, 10 years from now, and you imagine full humanoid robots doing their thing. But Amazon and others already have robots that are sorting objects, that are flying yeah. around warehouses to deliver things from one end to the other. And this is a mixture of that. Specifically, it mentions empty boxes, empty tote boxes to like <laughs> sort them around. But like, this is where it starts, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is where it starts. This is where it starts the robots throwing the empty boxes around That's right. with anger. And I yeah. guess they can also through end-to-end -end learning, it can drag unproductive employees out by the hair. <laughs> yes, so it, it yeah. actually aims for their head, which I think is a little unkind. It's a massive deployment of robots in the workforce. And this is the headline now. This is just going to be the reality tomorrow. And a lot of these jobs, you know, like these were human jobs that are going to get filled by these humanoid robots. And it does open up a giant question of like, okay, well, if these humanoid robots, maybe it takes back a lot of manufacturing from overseas, which is really great in some form for the American economy, not necessarily great for the American worker. I had a really great interview with John Stewart on the town talking about AI. And one of his biggest concerns, not viable, is the idea of what happens with the labor market, right? Like when these jobs start to go to robots, it's a big deal. And Amazon is a massive employer. So the robots are super cool and making things, but they're also causing American jobs to probably go away. And some will say, well, Gavin, it's it's the, the Mira Marathi trap of, well, but were they even good jobs if people had to like pee into Gatorade bottles and live with wristbands that would shock them because they were not sorting enough packages quickly enough? And it's not up to you or I to make the determination of what's a good job or not if someone needs slash wants a yeah, job of course. and that one's there. But what becomes of those jobs? Overnight, people aren't going to learn how to repair the robots, right? No, or engineer no. the floors. And even those jobs might go to other robots trained with Eventually. AI. So yeah, so yes. what? Uh, why are we doing any of this again? <laughs> Kevin, we're doing this because we believe that there's a future that ultimately could be better for everybody. And, you know, robots may be part of it. We've talked about on the show robots helping, especially elderly people as a specific way, especially humanoid robots. There's another big robot story uh, that folds into our first part where Figure 01, now sh they've released a video where they're showing it working fully autonomously in the BMW Group Spartanburg plant. So this is a robot that is now we're not sure I, I don't think this is deployed to to actually do this work but it is showing what yeah. it could be used to do in a car factory brett adcock yeah. who is the founder of figure robotics he says a couple things about this which is interesting one neural networks are driving all object manipulation mapping camera pixels to robot actions that means gone are the days of hard-coded you move here to these xyz coordinates and you do this in this specific way because the world can get messy 
and things could be out of position. And what we're seeing here is a robot very slowly manipulate large slabs of metal and move them about and place them with really intricate accuracy. And it's doing all that with AI systems, neural networks that yep. it's simulated on, and then they put it in the real world. Now the systems in this case, in this video, they're placing sheet metal in less than a one centimeter tolerance. That's how accurate it is. And the navigation is happening from object training and simulation, like I mentioned. Now, if you watch the video, you go, well, but it's moving slower than slow. You or I could probably move faster than that with no knowledge of the factory. But something that Brett said that was interesting is that you actually learn to optimize for speed way down the line. You wanna get the systems right first before you start ramping up the speed with which they work. And he alluded to the fact that he believes these robots as they exist, can do these tasks faster than a human when they turn the speed up, when they dial it up to 11. That's why. Yep. And do you know what's really wild, Kevin, is eventually those robots could be deployed in warfare, which is a very interesting and crazy question for all of us to be asking ourselves. The New York Times had a great story this week that was like focused around how autonomous drones are being used in the Ukraine. And I wanna make sure I get the, the actual headline is, AI begins ushering in an age of killer robots, which is a very uh, hyperbolic headline, but they're right. What they're talking about in this, it's a, I suggest if you've got a New York Times subscription, go, go read it, see if you can get somebody to gift it to you if you do not. But it basically talks about how autonomous drones are really changing the way warfare works across the world. But specifically, there's an active war in the world right now in the Ukraine, and the Ukrainians are leaning in hard. Obviously, we've talked about Palmer Lucky's company, Andrel, before, but this is even on a smaller level. There's a lot of startups that are actually going into these warfare zones and using autonomous weapons and autonomous drones to do the act of killing people. And when we talk about uh, AI and we talk about the, the advanced it makes. Again, this is about what do we want AI to be doing and how does AI work and what is it good at? This is something right now we're training it to do. And, and the bigger question is like, should war exist? It, it's existed for all of human history and it may exist going forward. But I don't know, Kevin, I don't feel great about this, but also no. maybe there's a world where this helps eliminate people from dying in some specific way, or I can't tell yeah. if it's better or worse for that. You know it's, what I mean? It's Ultimately. bizarre to see if you Go to the full article. It looks like a maker fair in parts. There's a Steam Deck in use. You don't imagine seeing a consumer gaming device used in warfare, but that's where we're getting with the off-the-shelf parts and these systems that you can sort of bolt on together. If you and I had to hack together something like this right now, Gavin, I can think of three AI tools that I could use to help a drone pilot itself autonomously, object yep. recognition, facial recognition, if you wanted to get that selective with the target. Like we could cobble that together now. So whether we like it or not, this will absolutely be changing the face of warfare. On the bright side, if it is wealthy, scared nations slamming toys against each other and it's not taking human lives in this new equation, yeah. I guess that's better than the alternative, right? If the fussy children or the defenders of freedom, whichever, however you look at conflict, if they can be slamming toys together in the sandbox and there's not a loss of human life, that is good. But something I've mentioned before is that what happens on the other side of that when one of yes. the sides runs out of toys? Does the white yeah. flag go up or do they start putting humans into their side of the equation? And that is where this thing gets really scary real quick. And not having a human in the loop is something that I don't know that, not that humans don't make mistakes, especially during warfare, they do. But knowing that a machine made the decision to potentially take a human life, that's a tough bridge for me to cross. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I mean, as we we've there's a lot of confusing and confound, uh, confounding ethical questions that we've talked about today, which I do think is important for people to kind of struggle with a little bit. As we do, we want to ask Quentin Vertigo his thoughts. <laughs> Sure, why not? Why not? Let's let's lighten this up. Maybe we ask Quentin Vertigo yeah. if he had to make a movie about AI warfare in the term in the vein of Inglorious Bastards, what would it be and give us a give us a title for it? All right, picture this. Curry and uh Code Hard Curry. A Bite to the Death. It's a tale of digital vengeance set in a neon-soaked cyberpunk dystopia where rogue AIs have declared war on humanity. Think Kill Bill meets The Matrix, but with a twist of lemon and a dash of insanity. <laughs> Our hero, a, a disgraced hacker named Jack Bite Bronson, oh, no. finds himself caught in the crossfire between Johnson? two Jack warring AI factions, oh. the cyborg samurai 
and the binary bandits. Of course. Jack's got uh, one mission, to hack his way to the truth before the world gets Carl alt deleted. Cheeky no, catchphrases. Okay, no. Oh, come on. That would have been Carl good. Carl alt deleted. Hack his way to the truth before the world gets control alt deleted. And I don't know I why. Like Carl alt, I like Carl alt deleted as a title. Wow. <laughs> and that is a huge waste of time. But we landed on a sincerity that the future That's of right. warfare deserves. All right, YouTube, thank you so much for watching this. We have a small change in our format this week. We are putting up the news video this week. So there is the news video. And if you go to our audio, you can listen to the full episode from this week. But we will have a special video coming out on Monday that will add in some special treats to the second part of the show. We're doing this change mostly because we're trying to figure out some ways to make this show both doable for us, but also to really work on all these platforms in different ways. We know that some of you may be upset that the entire show is not being uploaded here and we get that. It's about maximizing the impact that AI for Humans has by targeting each platform for what it is best for. And we hope to get enough resources potentially in the near future as we announce some plans to do just that to bring back full episodes. But right now we think we're gonna be better served and you, the audience, will be better served by having a video that is targeting the platform that you're on. So that's shorter form, better edited content for YouTube, and you can still go get the full podcast on the same day and date wherever you get your podcasts. And it's also because Gavin hates you. I, I don't want to understate that. Gavin was like, everything seems it's to be working. Fault, How can I upset fault. the audience? So please leave a comment if you hate it, specifically for Gavin. But if you understand it and the nuance of our situation, thank me, Kevin, your old pal, who would never disappoint you in the comments and this below. Is, this, is, this is true. Go ahead and do that. But also, this is not a for, forever scenario. We're just trying some different stuff. We are very thankful for all of you guys for watching us on YouTube. And we hope to continue to entertain you and do dumb stuff going forward yes so two videos on youtube every week we're upping the amount there if you want the full podcast though in the meantime go grab it on the podcast apps but thank you youtube